Good evening, friends, and welcome to Sleepy Time Tales, a podcast aimed at helping you to get a good night's sleep. Do you find your mind plagued with the stresses of modern life, especially when the lights are out and you're trying to get a restful night? Does your spinning mind keep you awake? Follow my voice down the path towards a good night's rest. Listen to me tell a story that will keep your mind from wandering to your daytime problems, the ones that you can't solve right now and will be easier to solve while rested. Listen to my voice and allow yourself to drift, following the twists and turns of the story but slowly letting go and drifting into sleep. A note for new listeners, if this is your first time joining us, part of the plan with the show is a long intro. This goes on for roughly 15 minutes, so if you want to get straight to the story, there is a timestamp in the show description that will get you straight there. But aside from a little bit of promotion I'm about to go into right now, the intro does serve a purpose, which I'll get into in a few minutes, so I recommend you stick around, at least if it's your first few times listening. Now many podcasts put their promotion and cup rattling halfway through or the show or at the end, but because I'm hoping you'll sleep long before we get there, I need to put this stuff up front. If you don't want to listen to it, there is that dumb timestamp in the show notes for the main story, and I do not take it personally if you skip to that. Now for those who've stuck around, it's a very big day for Sleepy Time Tales. The show has got its first official sponsor, and it's a big one. Mental health is important to me. I've spoken about insomnia as both a cause and consequence of mental health issues like anxiety and stress. And I don't like to overstate my own issues with anxiety because a lot of people have it much worse. But it is very real to me and it does keep me awake um, quite frequently. So if you suffer anxiety or any other issues or you simply feel like you need to talk to someone, try out BetterHelp. That's Better H-E-L-P. BetterHelp will assist your needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist who you can start communicating with in under 24 hours. This is not a crisis line and it is not self-help. It is professional counseling done securely online. There is a broad range of expertise in BetterHelp's counselor network which may not be locally available in many areas. And the service is available for clients worldwide and they have counsellors worldwide. You can log into your account at any time and send a message to your counsellor. You'll get timely and thoughtful responses, plus you can schedule weekly video or phone sessions so that you won't ever have to sit in a waiting room, as with traditional therapy. People often struggle to find a counsellor with whom they really gel, so BetterHelp makes this much easier for you by making it easy and free to change counsellors if needed. It's more affordable than traditional offline counselling and financial aid is available, And BetterHelp wants you to start living a happier life today, as do I, Dave, at Sleepy Time Tales. You can visit their website and read their testimonials that are posted there daily if you're concerned. That's at betterhelp.com slash reviews. And you can try it out using my link in the show notes for a 10% discount on your first month. So if you go to trybetterhelp.com slash sleepy time, that's trybetter H-E-L-P dot com slash sleepy time and join the over 500,000 people taking charge of their mental help with the help of an experienced professional. I haven't started myself yet because the last few weeks have been really busy for me since the folks at BetterHelp reached out, but I'm going to be starting my own journey with them. As well as supporting the sponsor, you can also support the show via Patreon. I'd like to thank new supporter Nicola Sharp, who signed up at Patreon last week. Nicola joins the people who have been so instrumental in helping me to keep the show running with their support. Whether you've backed the show for a few months or one month at any level, I'm very grateful for your support. And if you're finding that the show helps you to get a good night's sleep, whether weekly, nightly, or however often you listen, and you would like to help me keep the show running and for free, I'd like to ask you to take a look at patreon.com slash sleepytimetales or patron.sleepytimetales.net which you will also find linked in the show notes to take a look at the support levels and bonuses that are available to patrons. There are weekly bonus minisodes and special edits of standard episodes without the promotional bit and even story-only episodes depending at the level you sign up at. 
So if you're finding the show beneficial and have the means and inclination to help me to keep the show going and available for hundreds, if not thousands of people to help them to get a good night's sleep, please consider signing up at whatever level is comfortable to you to continue supporting my work. But another huge way you can help to spread the word is simply tell people about it. If there is someone in your life who you think will benefit from listening to Sleepy Time Tales, just let them know. If you recommend the show on social media, make sure to tag me in so that I know and I can thank you thank you properly. It's at Sleepy Time Tales on Instagram or Twitter. I also have the Audible trial, like every self-respecting podcast. If you go to audibletrial.com slash sleepy time and sign up for a 30-day tri- free trial, you'll get a free audiobook to keep as well as supporting supporting the show. I mentioned last week that I got a sign up and I didn't know who it was. I'd like to thank Jess, who probably is my gold star supporter since basically the first episode has done a lot to help me um, keep the show going and give me a lot of moral support as well. And um, last but not least, I would like to shout out the music, which is Undeser Bakumiku. Their music is available on the free music archive. I've linked their website and their Patreon in the show notes as they've got some very cool stuff that they've got released under various names that I definitely recommend you check out. Thanks very much. uh, And back to the show. So what exactly is Sleepy Time Tales? What is it for? It's a bit of a strange idea, isn't it? It's a podcast that you're supposed to fall asleep to. But lack of sleep is a health crisis in the 21st century and this is a... And this is a podcast that is intended to help those that it can to get a restful night. Do you find yourself lying awake at night with your mind spinning in emotions and turmoil with anxieties of 21st century life? Do you wake up in the middle of the night and find yourself not quite able to doze back off at 3am? I'm here to help. My name is Dave and I'm your narrator, here to help you into a restful night. I'm someone who has struggled to sleep ever since I was a baby. My parents had sleepless nights with me for many years, and even once I got old enough not to bother them, sleep was always uh, very difficult for me. It was only in the last few years that I discovered the tendency for droning voices, especially male ones, to act almost like a sedative for me. To put me to sleep as if I've been tranquilized. I used to find myself falling asleep to podcasts that I was trying to listen to at night because I couldn't sleep and then I discovered that there were podcasts out there specifically aimed at helping people to get some sleep. But often the ones that I recommended to people that worked for me didn't work for others and often because they didn't like the narrator's voice. So I thought to myself, I've got a slightly different voice but it's a droning male boring one so let me see if I can do my part to help others. Every episode of the show starts with this long intro that runs on usually for roughly about 15 minutes. There's a couple of reasons for it. Uh, The first one is to explain to new listeners what the purpose of the show is and try to sort of make the case for why I think I may be worth your time to spend spend it listening. The second purpose is for all the listeners For them, this is, well, what we're trying to do is we're trying to create new habits, trying to build a space together. And this long intro that goes on before the story even starts is basically intended to help them create um, new habits. This is the time now before settling in to fiddle around and obviously get the show started and switch your switch your phone screen off and to brush your teeth and have a glass of water and do whatever else you need to do before you get into bed so that by the time the story starts they're in a mental space and a physical space prepared for the story i suspect a good number of them probably don't even make it to the story to be honest for newer listeners though if you're hanging around still you probably haven't fallen asleep yet and um So let me explain the purpose of this intro for you. There's a couple of different ways to engage with the show. For me, when I listen to my sleep podcasts, what I need to do is I need something to focus on. A story or an event that lets me keep my mind on a specific point to stop it spinning out into stress and anxieties. I need something to focus on just enough to not resist sleep when it comes for me. 
The second way that I think a lot of people engage with the show is something a little bit more primal. Some people just need background noise, some kind of white noise, the sound of waves, the sound of rain, or some droning baritone like mine. Tonight's story is uh, the beginning of a classic mystery, The Hillman, by E. Philip Oppenheim, who I continually always try to call Oppenheimer, silly, weird habit of mine. Um, it's the story of a woman whose car breaks down in the middle of the countryside and meets a mysterious couple of men. Nothing too untoward happens. Just be, aw- be, be aware of that in case you're worried. Because at the end of the day, I'm not here to keep you awake. I'm here to help you to sleep. What's important, though, is as I tell you the story, you don't try to force it. You need to keep a light mental grip on, on, on the story, on the thread of this tale, and just allow the need for sleep to come creeping up on you. Obviously, I'm hoping that you're asleep before I get to the end of the episode, but it's important that you don't feel pressurized. It may not work on your first night. Maybe it'll take a few nights for you to get used to listening to my voice. Maybe my accent is strange to you. Maybe one episode isn't long enough. But whatever else, it's very important that you try to relax. If you're new to the show and prone to late nights lying staring at the ceiling, this may take some time to work for you, a few days even, and that's fine because we're trying to create new habits, as I said, it's, uh, and habits take time to develop. So queue up a few episodes or run through the backlog and let my voice drone on in the background. What I do with my sleep podcasts is I just let them play all night. I lie down in the dark with my earbuds in and let them go. Sometimes when I wake up at 3am, the stream is still running and the voices just waft me back to sleep. Sometimes what even happens with me is I wake up about 30 minutes before my alarm. That always used to really annoy me, but these days I just carry on listening and sometimes I fall back asleep again. And I've got to tell you, that 30 minutes can be the most restful part of my night. There's something about a deep sleep right before the alarm that's just very satisfying. And so you have the basic idea. You relax and you lie in the dark, and while you do that, I tell you a tale. So relax, dear listener. My nighttime friend is elected to lie in the dark, listening to my voice. You will always be safe with me. I'm here to help you relax, to improve your life in a small way, or maybe not so small. People don't sleep very well these days, and it makes their lives harder. So I'm here to do my small part to help you in a big way. To help you to face tomorrow and the day after, well rested and better able to cope and process. It's very, I believe very strongly in the benefits of kindness. I want to be kind to you. I want to share kindness with you. And it's all in vain if you just can't be kind to yourself. So don't beat yourself up or rebuke yourself over not sleeping. So don't get tense if you just can't get over the edge of sleep, even with me here in your ears trying to help. Frustration is one of the greater enemies of a good night's sleep, and the intention with this podcast is to short-circuit that frustration, to distract that feeling that we get when we blame ourselves for not being able to let go and drift into the dark. So take a breath, forgive the fact that you can't sleep, and let my voice wash over you. Take another breath. Imagine the warm darkness rising up, inviting you to sleep into a better life starting tomorrow. And if you can't let go, forgive yourself and we'll try again tomorrow. If you've had a life of insomnia, sleep is something like an enemy. But it's not your enemy. It's a natural process that we've been pulled away from by stress and life and supposed progress shining bright lights in our eyes at all hours. I'm here to work with you to create a safe space, a cocoon in which you can curl up and allow nature to take its course. So if you're still with me, thank you for staying. If you're already asleep, we'll chat again soon. And of course, you aren't hearing me, except maybe in a dream.
The Hillman by E. Phillips Oppenheim. Available on Project Gutenberg. You can find the link to that in the show notes. Chapter 1 Louise, self-engrossed and with a pleasant sense of detachment from the prospective inconveniences of the moment, was leaning back amongst the cushions of the motionless car. Her eyes lifted upward, travelled past the dimly lit hillside with its patchwork of worn enclosed fields, up to where the leaning clouds and the unseen heights met in a misty sea of obscurity. The moon had not yet risen, but a faint and luminous glow spreading like a halo about the topmost peak of that ragged line of hills heralded its approach. Louise sat with clasped hands, wrapped and engrossed in the aesthetic appreciation of a beauty which found its way but seldom into her town-enslaved life. She listened to the sound of a distant sheep bell. Her eyes swept the hillsides, vainly, yet without curiosity, for any sign of a human dwelling. The voices of her chauffeur and her maid, who stood talking heatedly together by the bonnet of the car, seemed to belong to another world. She had the air of one completely yet pleasantly detached from all material surroundings. The maid, leaving her discomforted companion with a final burst of reproaches, came to the side of the car. Her voice, when she addressed her mistress, sank to a lower key, but her eyes still flashed with anger. But would Madame believe it, she exclaimed. It is incredible. The man Charles here, who calls himself a chauffeur of experience, declares that we are what he calls hung up. Something unexpected has happened to the magneto. There is no spark. Whose fault can that be, I ask, but the chauffeur's? And such a desert we have reached. We have searched the map together. We are thirty miles from any town, many miles from even a village. What a misfortune. Louise turned her head regretfully away from the mysterious spaces. She listened patiently, but without any sort of emotion, to her maid's flow of distressed words. She even smiled very faintly when the girl had finished. Something will happen, she remarked indifferently. There is no need for you to distress yourself. There must be a farmhouse or shelter of some sort near. If worst comes to worst, we can spend the night in the car. We have plenty of furs and rugs. You are not a good traveller, Aline. You lose heart too soon. The girl's face was a study. Madame speaks of spending the night in the car, she exclaimed. Why, one has not eaten since luncheon, and of all the country through which we have passed, this is the loneliest and dreariest spot. Louise leaned forward and called to the chauffeur. Charles, she asked, what has happened? Are we really stranded here? The man's head emerged from the bonnet. He came around to the side of the car. I'm very sorry, madam, he reported, but something has gone wrong with Magneto. I shall have to take it to pieces before I can tell exactly what is wrong. At present, I can't get a spark of any sort. There is no hope of immediate repair, then. The chauffeur shook his head dolefully. I shall have to take the Magneto down, madam, he said. It will take several hours and it ought to be done by daylight. And in the meantime, what do you suggest that we do, she asked. The man looked a little helpless. His battle over words with Aline had depressed him. I heard a dog bark a little while ago, he remarked. Perhaps I'd better go and see whether there isn't a farm somewhere near. And leave us here alone, Aline exclaimed indignantly. It is a good suggestion. It comes well from a man who has got us into such trouble. Her mistress smiled at her reassuringly. What have we to fear, you foolish girl? For myself, I would like better than anything to remain here until the moon comes up over the top of that round hill. But listen, it is just as I told you, there is no necessity for Charles to leave us. They all turned their heads. From some distance behind on the hard, narrow road, curling like a piece of white tape around the hillside, they came, faintly at first, but more distinctly every moment, the sound of horses' hoofs. It is as I told you, Louise said composedly. Someone approaches, on horseback too. He will be able to fetch assistance. The chauffeur walked back a few yards, prepared to give early warning to the approaching horseman. 
The two women standing up in the car watched the spot where the road, hidden for some time in the valley, came into sight. Louder and louder came the sound of the beating of hoofs. Louise gave a little cry as a man on horseback appeared in sight at the crest of the hill. The narrow strip of road seemed suddenly dwarfed, an unreasonable portion of the horizon blotted out. In the half-life, there was something almost awesome in the unusual size of the horse and of the man who rode it. It is a world of goblins, the Selene, her mistress exclaimed softly. What is this that comes? It is a human being, dear mercy, the maid replied with a matter-of-fact little sigh of content. Conscious of the obstruction in the road, the rider slackened his speed. His horse, a great dark-colored animal, pricked up his ears when scarcely a dozen yards away from the car, stopped short and suddenly bolted out onto the open moor. There was a sound of a heavy whip, a loud masterful voice and a very brief struggle, during which the horse once plunged and reared so high that Louise, watching, cried out in fear. A few moments later, however, horse and rider, the former quivering and subdued, were beside the car. Has anything happened? the newcomer asked, raising his whip to his hat. He addressed Louise, instinctively conscious, even in that dim light, that she was the person in authority. She did not at once reply. Her eyes were fixed on the face of her questioner. There was little enough of him to be seen, yet she was aware of an exceptional interest in his dimly revealed personality. He was young, unusually tall, and his voice was cultivated. Beyond that, she could see or divine nothing. He, for his part, with his attention still largely engaged in keeping his horse under control, yet knew in those first moments that he was looking into the face of a woman who had no kinship with the world in which he had been born and lived his days. Those were fugitive thoughts which passed between them, only half conceived, yet strong enough to remain as first and unforgettable impressions. Then the commonplace interests of the situation became insistent. I have broken down, Louise said. My chauffeur tells me that it will take hours to effect some necessary repair to the car, and meanwhile, here we are. You couldn't have chose a worse place for a breakdown, the young man observed. You are miles away from anywhere. You are indeed a comforter, Louise murmured. Do you think that you could possibly get down and advise us what to do? You look so far away up there. There was another brief struggle between the man and his still frightened horse. Then the former swung himself down and with the bridle through his arm came and stood by the car. If there is any way in which I can help, he ventured, I am quite at your service. Louise smiled at him. She remained unoppressed by any fear of inconvenience or hardship. She had the air of one rather enjoying her plight. Well, you have begun very nicely by doing what I asked you, she said. You know, to an impressionable person there was something rather terrifying about you when you appeared suddenly from out of the shadows in such a lonely place. I was beginning to wonder whether you were altogether real, whether one of these black hills there had not opened to let you out. You see, I know something of the legends of your country, though I have never been here before. The young man was less at his ease. He stood tapping his boot, nervously, with his long riding whip. I am sorry if I frightened you, he said. My horse is a little restive, and the acetylene light which your chauffeur turned on him was sufficiently alarming. You did not exactly frighten me, she assured him, but you looked so abnormally large. Please tell us what you would advise us to do. Is there a village near here, or an inn, or even a barn, or shall we have to spend the night in the car? The nearest village, he replied, is twelve miles away. Fortunately, my own home is close by. I shall be very pleased, I and my brother, if you will honor us. I'm afraid I cannot offer you very much in the way of entertainment. She rose briskly to her feet and beamed upon him. You are indeed a good Samaritan, she exclaimed. A roof is more than we had dared to hope for, although when one looks up at this wonderful sky and breathes this air, one wonders, perhaps, whether a roof, after all, is such a blessing. It gets very cold towards morning, the young man said practically. Of course, she assented. Aline, you will bring my dressing bag and follow us. The gentleman is kind enough to offer us shelter for the night. 
Dear me, you really are almost as tall as you appeared, she added as she stood by his side. For the first time in my life, you make me feel undersized. He looked down at her, a little more at his ease now, by the reason of the friendliness of her manner, although he had still the air of one embarked upon an adventure, the outcome of which was to be regarded with some qualms. She was of little more than medium height, and his first impressions of her was that she was thin and too pale to be good-looking, that her eyes were large and soft with eyebrows more clearly defined than usual among English women, and she moved without seeming to walk. I suppose I am tall, he admitted, as I started off along the road. One doesn't notice it around here. My name is John Strangeway, and our house is just behind that clump of trees there on the top of the hill. We will do our best to make you comfortable, he had a little doubtfully, but there are only my brother and myself, and we have no women servants in the house. A roof of any sort will be a luxury, she assured him. I only hope that we shall not be a trouble to you in any way. And your name, please, he asked. She was a little amazed at his directness, but she answered him without hesitation. My name, she told him, is Louise. He leaned down towards her, a little puzzled. Louise, but your surname? She laughed softly. It occurred to him that nothing like her laugh had been ever been heard on the grey-walled stretch of mountain road. Never mind. I am traveling incognito. Who I am or where I am going, well, what does that matter to anybody? Perhaps I do not know myself. You can imagine, if you like, that we came from the heart of your hills and that tomorrow they will open again and welcome us back. I don't think there are any motor cars in fairyland, he objected. We represent a new edition of fairy law, she told him. Modern romance, you know, includes motor cars and even French maids. All the same, he protested, with masculine bluntness, I really don't see how I can introduce you to my brother as Louise from Fairyland. She evaded the point. Tell me about your brother. Is he as tall as you, and is he young or older? He is nearly twenty years older, her companion replied. He's about my height, but he stoops more than I do, and his hair is grey. I'm afraid that you may find him a little peculiar. Her escort paused and swung open a white gate on their left-hand side. Before them was an ascent which seemed to her in the dim light to be absolutely precipitous. Do we have to climb up that? she asked ruefully. It isn't so bad as it looks, he assured her, and I'm afraid it's the only way up. The house is at the bend there, barely fifty yards away. You can see a light through the trees. You must help me then, please, she begged. He stooped down towards her. She linked her fingers together through his left arm and, leaning a little heavily upon him, began the ascent. He was conscious of some subtle fragrance from her clothes, a perfume strangely different from the odor of the ghost-like flowers that bordered the steep path at which they were climbing. Her arms, slight, warm things though they were, and great though his own strength, felt suddenly like a yoke. At every step he seemed to feel their weight more insistent, a weight not physical, solely due to this rush of unexpected emotions. It was he now whose thoughts rushed away to that medley of hill legends of which she had spoken. Was she indeed a creature of flesh and blood, of the same world as the dull people among whom he lived? Then he remembered the motor car, the chauffeur and the French maid, and he gave a little sigh of relief. Are we nearly there, she asked. Do tell me if I lean too heavily upon you. It is only a few steps further, he replied encouragingly. Please lean upon me as heavily as you like. She looked around her almost in wonder as her companion paused with his hand upon a little iron gate. From behind that jagged stretch of hills in the distance, the corner of the moon had now appeared. By its light, looking backward, she could see the road which they had left below, the moorland stretching away into the misty space, an uneasy panorama with its masses of grey boulders, its clumps of gorse, its hillocks and hollows. Before her, through the little iron gate which her escort had pushed open, was a garden a little austere-looking with its prim flower beds, filled with hyacinths and crocuses, bordering on the flinty walks. The trees were all bent in the same direction, fashioned after one pattern by the winds. Before them was the house. 
a long, low building, part of it covered with some kind of creeper. As they stepped across the last few yards of lawn, the black oak door which they were approaching suddenly opened. A tall, elderly man stood looking inquiringly out. He shaded his eyes with his hands. Is that you, brother? he asked doubtfully. John Strangeway ushered his companion into the square, oak-panelled hall. Hung with many trophies of the chase, a few oil paintings, here and there some sporting prints. It was lighted only with a single lamp which stood upon a round, polished table in the centre of the white-flagged floor. This lady's motor car has broken down, Stephen, John explained, turning a little nervously towards his brother. I found them in the road, just at the bottom of the hill. She and her servants will spend the night here. I have explained that there is no village or inn for a good many miles. Louise turned graciously to the boy, the elder man, who was standing grimly apart. Even in those few seconds, her quick sensibilities warned her of the hostility which lurked behind his tightly closed lips and steel grey eyes. His bow was stiff and uncordial, and he made no movement to offer his hand. We are not used to welcoming ladies at Peak Hall, madam, he said. I am afraid you will find us somewhat unprepared for guests. I ask for nothing more than a roof, Louise assured him. John threw his hat and whip upon the round table and stood in the centre of the stone floor. She caught a glance which flashed between the two men, of appeal from the one, of icy resentment from the other. We can at least add to the roof a bed and some supper, and a welcome, John declared. Is that not so, Stephen? The older man turned deliberately away. It was as if he had not heard his brother's words. I will go and find Jennings, he said. He must be told about the servants. Louise watched the disappearing figure until it was out of sight. Then she looked up into the face of the younger man who was standing by her side. I am sorry, she murmured apologetically. I am afraid that your brother is not pleased at this sudden intrusion. Really, we shall give you very little trouble. He answered her with a sudden eager enthusiasm. He seemed far more natural than at any time since he had ridden up from the shadows to take his place in her life. I won't apologize for Stephen, he said. He's a little crotchety. You must please be kind and not notice. You must let me, if I can, offer you enough welcome for us both. Chapter 2 Louise, with a heavy sulfur-plated candlestick in her hand, stood upon the uneven floor of the bedroom to which she had been conducted looking up at the oak frame family tree which hung above the broad chimney piece. She examined the coat of arms emblazoned in the corner and peered curiously at the last neatly printed edition, which indicated Stephen and John Strangeway as the sole survivors of a diminishing line. When at last she turned away, she found the name upon her lips. Strangeway, she murmured. John Strangeway. The name seems to bring something into my memory. Have I ever known anyone with such a name, Aline? Never, madame, to the best of my belief, she declared. Yet I too seem to have heard it, and lately. It is perplexing. One has seen it somewhere. One finds it familiar. Louise shrugged her shoulders. She stood for a moment looking around her before she laid down the candlestick. The room was of unusual size, with two worm and beams across the ceiling. The windows were casemented, with broad seats in each recess. The dressing table, upon which her belongings were set out, was of solid black oak, as was also the framework of the huge sofa, the mirror, and the chairs. The ancient four-poster, hung with chintz and supported by carved pillars, was spread with fine linen and covered with a quilt made of small pieces of silk, lavender perfumed. The great wardrobe, with its solid mahogany doors, seemed ancient enough to have stood in its place since the building of the house itself. A log of sweet-smelling wood burned cheerfully in the open fireplace. Really, Louise decided, we have been most fortunate. This is an adventure. Aline, give me some black silk stockings and some black slippers. I will change nothing else. The maid obeyed in somewhat ominous silence. Her mistress, however, was living in a world of her own. John Strangeway, she murmured to herself glancing across the room at the family tree. 
It is really curious how that name brings with it a sense of familiarity. It is so unusual too. And what an unusual looking person. Do you think, Aline, that you ever saw anyone so superbly handsome? The maid's little grimace was expressive. Never, madame, she replied. And yet to think of it, a gentleman, a person of intelligence, who lives here always outside the world with just a terrible old manservant, the only domestic in the house. Nearly all the cooking is done at the bailiffs a quarter of a mile away. Louise nodded thoughtfully. It is very strange, she admitted. I should like to understand it. Perhaps, she added half to herself, some day I shall. She passed across the room and on her way paused before an old cheval glass, before which were suspended two silver candlesticks complained to before which were suspended two silver candlesticks containing lighted wax candles. She looked steadfastly at her own reflection. A little smile parted her lips. In the bedroom of this quaint farmhouse, she was looking upon a face and a figure which the illustrated papers and the enterprises of a modern photographer had combined to make familiar to the world. A curious feeling came to her that she was looking at the face of a stranger. She gazed earnestly into the mirror with new eyes and a new curiosity. She contemplated critically the lines of her slender figure and its neat, perfectly tailored skirt. The figure of a girl, it seemed, notwithstanding her twenty-seven years. Her soft white blouse was opened up at the neck, displaying a beautifully rounded throat. Her eyes travelled upward and dwelt with an almost passionate interest upon the oval face, a little paler at that moment than usual with its earnest brown eyes its faint silky eyebrows, its strong yet mobile features, its lips a little full perhaps, but soft and sensitive, at the masses of brown hair drawn low over her ears. This was herself then. Did she really justify her reputation for beauty, or was she just a cult, the passing craze of a world a little weary of the ordinary standards? Or again, was it only her art that had focused the admiration of the world upon her? How would she seem to these two men downstairs, she asked herself, the doer, grim master of the house and her more youthful rescuer, whose coming had somehow touched her fancy. They saw so little of her sex. They seemed in a sense to be in league against it. Would they find out that they were entertaining an angel unawares? She thought with a gratified smile of her incognito. It was a real trial of her strength, this... When she turned away from the mirror, the smile still lingered upon her lips. A soft light of anticipation was shining in her eyes. John met her at the foot of the stairs. She noticed with some surprise that he was wearing the dinner jacket and black tie of civilization. Will you come this way, please, he begged. Supper is quite ready. He held open the door of one of the rooms on the other side of the hall and she passed into a low dining room, dimly lit with shaded lamps. The older brother rose from his chair as they entered, although his salutation was even grimmer than his first welcome. He was wearing a dress coat of old-fashioned cut and a black stock, and he remained standing without any smile or word of greeting until she had taken her seat. Behind his chair stood a very ancient manservant in a grey pepper-and-salt suit with a white tie, whose expression at the entrance of this unexpected guest seemed curiously to reflect the inhospitable instincts of his master. Although conscious of this atmosphere of antagonism, Louise looked around her with frank admiration as she took her place in the high-backed chair which John was holding for her. The correctness of the setting appealed strongly to her artistic perceptions. The figures and features of the two men, Stephen, tall, severe, stately, John, amazingly handsome but of the same type, the black rafted ceiling, the Jacobian sideboard, The huge easy chairs, the fine prints upon the walls, the pine log which burned upon the open hearth. Nowhere did there seem to be any single alien or modern note. The table was laid with all manner of cold dishes supplemented by others on the sideboard. There were pots of jam and honey, a silver teapot and silver spoons and forks of quaint design, strangely cut glass and a great Dresden bowl filled with flowers. I am afraid, John remarked, that you are not used to dining at this hour. My brother and I are very old-fashioned in our customs. If we had a little longer notice, 
I've never in my life saw anything that looked so delicious as your cold chicken, Louise declared. May I have some, and some ham? I believe that you must farm some land yourselves. Everything looks as if it were homemade or homegrown. We are certainly farmers, John admitted with a smile, and I don't think that there is much here that isn't of our own production. Of course, one must have some occupation living so far out of the world, Louise murmured. I really am the most fortunate person. She continued. My car comes to grief in what seems to be a wilderness, and I find myself in a very palace of plenty. I'm not sure you made agrees, John laughed. She seemed rather horrified when she found there was no woman servant about the place. Aline is spoiled without a doubt, her mistress declared, but is that really the truth? Absolutely. But how do you manage, Louise went on. Don't you need dairy maids, for instance? The farm buildings are some distance from the house, John explained. There's quite a little colony at the back, and the woman who superintends the dairy lives here. It is only in the house that we are entirely dependent of your sex. We manage somehow or the other with Jennings here and two boys. You're not both woman haters, I hope. Her younger host flashed a glance at Louise, but it was too late. Stephen had laid down his knife and fork and was leaning in her direction. Madam, he intervened. Since you have asked the question, I will confess that I have never known any good come to a man of our family from the friendship or service of women. Our family history, if ever you should come to know it, would amply justify my brother and myself for our attitude towards your sex. Stephen, John remonstrated, a slight frown on his face. Need you weary our guest with your peculiar views? It is scarcely polite to say the least of it. The older man sat for a moment, grim and silent. Perhaps you're right, brother, he admitted. The lady did not seek our company, but it may interest her to know that she is the first woman who has crossed the threshold of Peak Hall for a matter of six years. Louise looked from one to the other, half incredulously. Do you really mean it? Is that literally true? She asked John. Absolutely, the young man assured her. But please remember that you are nonetheless heartily welcome here. We have few women neighbors and intercourse with them seems to have slipped from our lives. Tell me, how far have you come today and where did you hope to sleep tonight? Louise hesitated for a moment. For some reason or other, the question seemed to bring with it some unexpected and disturbing thought. I was motoring from Edinburgh. As regards tonight, I had not made up my mind. I rather hope to reach Kendall. My journey is not at all an interesting matter to talk about, she went on. Tell me about your life here. It sounds most delightfully pastoral. Do you really mean that you produce nearly everything yourselves? Your honey and preserves and bread and butter, for instance? Are they all homemade? And our hams, the young man laughed, and everything else upon the table. You underestimate the potentiality of male labor. Jennings is certainly a better cook than the average woman. Everything you see was cooked by him. We have a sort of secondary kitchen, though, down at the bailiffs, where the preserves are made and some of the other things. And you live here all year round, she asked. My brother, John told her, has not been further away from the nearest market town for nearly 20 years. Her eyes grew round with astonishment. But you go to London sometimes? I was there eight years ago. Since then, I've not been further away than Carlisle or Kendall. I go into the camp near Kendall for three weeks every, every year. Territorial training, you know. But how do you pass your time? What do you do with yourself? She asked. Farm, he answered. Farming is our daily occupation. Then for amusement we hunt, shoot and fish. The seasons pass before we know it. She looked appraisingly at John's strange way. Notwithstanding his suntan cheeks and the splendid vigor of his form, there was nothing in the least agricultural about his manner or his appearance. There was humor as well as intelligence in his clear gray eyes. She opined that the books which lined the one side of the room were at once his property and his hobby. It is a very healthy life, no doubt, she said, but sometimes it seems incomprehensible to think of a man like yourself living always in such an out-of-the-way corner, with no desire to see what is going on in the world or to be able to form any estimate of the change in men's thoughts and habits. Human life seems to me to be so much more interesting than anything else.
Does this all sound a little impertinent? She wound up naively. I'm so sorry. My friends spoil me, I believe, and I get into the habit of saying things just as they come into my head. John's lips were open to reply, but Stephen once more intervened. Life means a different thing to each of us, madam, he said sternly. There are many born with the lust for cities and the crowded places in their hearts, born with the desire to mingle with their fellows, to absorb the conventional vices and virtues, to become one of the multitude. It has been different with us strange ways. Jennings, at a sign from his master, removed the tea equipage, evidently produced in honour of their visitor. Three tall-stemmed glasses were placed upon the table and a decanter of port reverently produced. Louise had fallen for a moment or two into a fit of abstraction. Her eyes were fixed upon the opposite wall from which, out of their faded frames, a row of grim-looking men and women, startlingly like her two hosts, seemed to frown upon her. Is that your father? she asked, moving her head towards one of the portraits. My grandfather, John Strangeway, Stephen told her. Was he one of the wanderers? He left Cumberland only twice during his life. He was master of the hounds, magistrate, colonel in the yeomanry of that period, and three times he refused to stand for parliament. John Strangeway, Louise repeated, softly to herself. I was looking at your family tree upstairs, she went on. It is curious how both my maid and myself were struck with a sense of familiarity about the name, as if we had heard or read something about it quite lately. Her words were almost carelessly spoken, but she was conscious of the somewhat ominous silence which ensued. She glanced up wonderingly and intercepted a rapid look passing between the two men. More puzzled than ever, she turned towards John as if for an explanation. He had risen somewhat abruptly to his feet and his hand was upon the back of her chair. Will it be disagreeable to you if my brother smokes a pipe, he asked. I tried to have our little drawing room prepared for you, but the fire has not been lit for so long that the room, I'm afraid, is quite impossible. Do let me stay here with you, she begged, and I hope that both of you will smoke. I am quite used to it. John wheeled up an easy chair for her. Stephen, stiff and upright, sat on the other side of the hearth. He took the tobacco jar and pipe that his brother had brought him and slowly filled the bowl. With your permission then, madam, he said, as he struck a match. Louise smiled graciously. Some instinct prompted her to stifle her own craving for a cigarette and to keep her little gold case hidden in her pocket. All the time her eyes were wandering around the room. Suddenly she rose and, moving around the table, stood once more facing the row of gloomy-looking portraits. So that is your grandfather, she remarked to John, who had followed her. Is your father not here? He shook his head. My father's portrait was never painted. Tell the truth, John, Stephen enjoined, rising in his place and sitting down his pipe. Our father's portrait is not here, madam, because he was one of those of whom I have spoken, one of those who was drawn to the vortex of the city and who knew only the shallow ways of life. Listen. With a heavy silver candlestick in either hand, Stephen crossed the room. He raised them high above his head and pointed to the pictures one by one. John Robert Strangeway, our great-grandfather, he began. That picture was a presentation from the farmers of Cumberland. He too was a magistrate and held many public offices in the county. By his side is his brother, Stephen George Strangeway. For 35 years he took the chair at the farmer's ordinary at Market Ketton on every Saturday at one o'clock. And there was never a deserving man in this part of the county, engaged in agricultural pursuits, who at any time sought his aid in vain. They always knew where he was to be found, and every Saturday before dinner was served, there would be someone there to seek his aid or advice. He lived his life to his own benefits and to the benefits of his neighbours, the life which we are all sent here to lead. Two generations before him, you see my namesake, Stephen Strangeway. It was he who invented the first threshing machine used in this county. He farmed the land that my brother and I own today. He was church warden at our little church, and he too was a magistrate. He did his duty in a smaller way, but zealously and honestly among the hillmen of this district. There are gaps in your family history, Louise observed. The gaps, madam, Stephen explained, are left by those who have abandoned their natural heritage. We strangeways were hill folk and farmers by descent and destiny for more than 400 years. 
our places here upon the land, almost among the clouds, and those of us who have realized it have led the lives God meant us to lead. There have been some of our race who have been tempted into the lowlands and the cities. Not one of them brought honor upon our name. Their pictures are not here. They are not worthy to be here. Stephen set down the candlesticks and returned to his place. Louise, with her hands clasped behind her back, glanced towards John, who still stood by her side. Tell me, she asked him, have none of your people who went out into the world done well for themselves? Scarcely one, he admitted. My brother's words seem a little sweeping, but they are very near the truth. The air of the great city seemed to have poisoned every strange way. Not one, Stephen interrupted. Colonel John Strangeway died leading his regiment at Waterloo, and end well enough, but reached through many years of evil conduct and loose living. He was a brave soldier, John put in quietly. That is true, Stephen admitted. His best friends have claimed no other quality for him. Madam, he went on, turning towards Louise, lest my welcome to you this evening should have seemed inhospitable, let me tell you this. Every strange way who has left our county and trodden the downward path of failure has done so at the instance of one of your sex. That is why those of us who inherited the family spirit look askance upon all strange women. It is why no woman is ever welcome within this house. Louise resumed her seat in the easy chair. I'm so sorry, she murmured, looking down at her slipper. I could not help breaking down here, could I? Nor could my brother fail to offer you the hospitality of this roof, Stephen admitted. The incident was unfortunate but inevitable. It is a matter for regret that we have so little to offer you in the way of entertainment. He rose to his feet. The door had been opened. Jennings was behind there with a candlestick upon a massive silver salver. Behind him was Aline. You are doubtless fatigued by your journey, madam, Stephen concluded. Louise made a little grimace, but she rose at once to her feet. She understood quite well that she was being sent to bed, and she shivered a little when she looked at the hour. Barely ten o'clock. Yet it was all in keeping. From the doorway, she looked back to the room in which nothing seemed to have been touched for centuries. She stood upon the threshold to bid her final good night, fully conscious of the complete anachronism of her presence here. Her smile for Stephen was respectful and full of dignity. As she glanced towards John, however, something flashed in her eyes and quivered at the corner of her lips. Something which escaped her control. Something which made him grip for a moment the back of the chair against which he stood. Then, between the old man's servant who insisted upon carrying her candle to her room and her maid who walked behind, she crossed the white stone hall and stepped slowly up the broad flights of stairs. Thanks again for joining me on this episode of Sleepy Time Tales. The podcast designed around a bedtime story to help you to get a restful night. New episodes will be released every Sunday night to give you something fresh to help you rest in a new week. But make sure to subscribe in whatever service you use so that you get your new episodes whenever they come out. A reminder that the music for tonight is Un Désert by Kumiku. Check out more of their work on their website and their Patreon, which you will find linked in the show notes. Good night and sweet dreams.